Meeting is starting. Welcome to the first Nylo panel of the year 2012. Tonight we will be hearing from John Romero who works for Opscode, the company that brought us the increasingly popular integration management framework chat. Before we begin, I'd like to take a few minutes to share some announcements and thank and introduce the various people involved. Tonight we are here because a number of Googlers, including but not limited to Jared Brothers, Santosh Budala, Jimmy Kaplowitz, David Lampel, Mohit Mathana, Richard Woodbury, Tom Lomancelli, Tony Rippey, Jorgen Walston, Mike Journey, and Malik Kangara have agreed to take time out of their evening to open their doors and host us here in Google's spacious facilities. In addition to Google, I would like to thank our other sponsors, IBM, Canonical, Brando Group, and O'Reilly Media. I'd also like to thank Nylog's volunteers for all the hard work they do and have done over the years to keep the organization running. We are the oldest Linux user group in New York City, and it is thanks to our volunteers that we are still operating today. Tonight, we have David Bristow and Rob Menez, uh, in the back, running video, uh, our workshop team, who are Rob Menez, Jonas Arnaldo, David Bristow, and Hannah Aisman. They run our workshop meetings every other week. Our mailing list administration team of Greg Levine and Chris Nadel. Our server admin team of Aaron Grogan and Chris Nadel. Our meeting organization team of Danny Rathjens and Mark Russell. Our web team of Stephanie Schultz. Jeremy Donson, Fernando Oroku, Scott Wolfo, and Javelin Tardiev. Our num numerous contributors at large, especially Jim Gleason, Ron Guerin, Tony Marchesano, Larry DeCovney, Peter Norton, and Sonny Dubay. Tonight, if you need anything or have any questions, feel free to grab either myself, Mark Russell, Sonny Dubay, Danny Rathjens, or Aaron Grogan. I'd like to let you guys know about our upcoming meetings and talks for the rest of this year. This month we have two meetings in addition to this, our presentation. Some of you in the audience are aware that we've been working on incorporation. As of a week or so ago, we have tentative word from the state that we are now officially a New York State not-for-profit. This is the beginning of the processes and there is still a lot of work to do to build the charter. It is currently workshop will be meeting on the last day of this month, Tuesday, January 31st, also at the Hudson Park Library. For the remainder of this year, we have some very interesting talks coming up. Next month, on February 9th, we will be learning about R, a strongly functional language and environment used to statistically explore data sets. In March, we will hear about Puppet, which many of you have probably heard of, as it is an alternate configuration management framework to Chef. In April, we will be hearing from the good folks at HP about WebOS, and with any luck, their plans to open source it. In May, we will be hearing about the programming language Go. In June, the topic will be Shorewall, a fairly widely used software package for managing Linux firewalls and keeping servers secure. In July, we will hear, be hearing about Juju, a new sor service orchestration framework for Ubuntu. In August, Drupal.org contributors will share their lessons learned and their experiences gained from their successful migration of their large distributed open source project from CDS to Git. In September, we will learn about scientific computing with Python, and in October, we will have a technical deep dive into Gennetti, which is a cluster-based virtualization management framework. A few announcements. Tonight, after Sean's talk, we will be raffling off a copy of 
test-driven infrastructure with Chef, as well as a handful of DRM-free eBooks from O'Reilly Media. Our website team is hard at work, getting prepared to relaunch the Nilo job site and redesign our main website. This meeting was our first general meeting that was announced on meetup.com. Going forward, we will announce all general audience meetings on meetup.com in addition to announcing them on our mailing list. The workshop team is interested in hosting formal Linux beginner talks. If you are interested in giving such a talk, please contact them. Going forward, because we may meet in a number of different spaces, we may need to institute a real name policy for meeting RSVPs. This means you may be asked to RSVP for our talks with a full name that matches a government issued ID, which you would need to bring to the meetings. Tonight, after this meeting, Aaron Grogan and Sunny Dubay will be leading us to a local drinking establishment to continue a long-standing tr Nilo tradition. Stamstisch, which is German for regular table, or more loosely, a group that hangs out regularly. This should be a good opportunity to talk to other folks who attended tonight. I also believe that Sean, our speaker, will be joining us. Speaking of Sean, my time is up, and I'd like to introduce you to Sean Omira from Opscode, and I hope you enjoy his talk on chat. Microphone, just so we can get it on the video. All right. Uh, let me try this one. Hello. Okay. So, um, let's see here. Alright. Alright, well, uh, this is my introductory uh, slide deck on Chef. Uh, I doctored up just for you guys. So, here we go. Nylog January 2012, Introduction to Chef. So, uh, like most presentations I give, I'm going to start this one out uh, by saying, congratulations, right? you have some cloud. Um, if you don't yet, uh, you will in the future. Um, pretty much all classical um, you know, like hosting providers where like, you would go and say, I need a box, you know, they're all being converted to infrastructure as a service providers. Um, Internally to Google, I believe uh, Gennetti is what people use if they need to uh, provision some compute resources to start developing JRandom app, um, another infrastructure as a service cloud provider. So this is uh, what we're going to start out looking at. Um, so APIs, what, that's, this is what makes cloud cloud, right? So I, I'm just I'm just as annoyed with the whole cloud thing as the rest of you, right? So like <laughs> cloud is. Everything's cloud watched, right? Like anybody that makes a product that's even like remotely related to the internet in any fashion, they like, stick the cloud on it, right? Um, that's unfortunate because there actually is like real technology there, right? Like you are able to like make an API call, get compute resources, use them, make another API call, release them, and that's infrastructure as a service, um, and that's awesome. And Chef has lots of little plugins that can help you manipulate that stuff. So EC2, uh, Rackspace, our friends at Voxel back there, they can provision hardware to Voxel, not a VM. Uh, all the little internal things that you've, you've heard of, like CloudStack, vSphere, your VMware cluster, uh, Eucalyptus, OpenStack, these sorts of things. These are all API-driven infrastructure as a service um, systems. Okay. So, Chef does that, but then what do you do? Like you, great, so I can make an API call and I can provision you know, an entire rack of servers. It's available to me 
but then what, right? It's basically worthless to you until you configure it. Okay? So all it's going to do is basically sit there eating electricity and costing you money. So it used to be the case that you know it took a lot longer to actually provision the machine than it did to configure it. Right? So you'd have to make a phone call, call it Dell, right? Uh, some guy on the other end would you know, take your order and put your machine in a box and mail it to you and then you'd have to take it out of the box and bloody knuckle it to a rack somewhere and like, you know, that took six months, right? And now you can do it in six seconds, so. Uh, you need to be able to configure things uh, a lot faster now in order to actually take advantage uh, of the speed at which you can provision compute resources, so. This is why configuration is something you do. So you can configure them. And okay, so applications. So you've probably heard the statement that uh, cloud is an application-centric operations model. Um, this is especially apparent when you're using infrastructure as a service uh, cloud providers. So you provision a bunch of machines, and you need to actually configure your infrastructure to make them do something. Um, and when you're actually dividing up the governance of these machines, you need to focus at the application level. So systems administrators, they're done. No more systems administrators. You have applications administrators now. They happen to also administer systems, but you need to move it up a layer into the application because your server named Thor like, is no longer a thing, right? So start thinking about it at the application level. And we're going to talk about infrastructure automation. Um, and infrastructure is a general, general term. So we're going to uh, turn this into a specific technical term. So I'm going to define infrastructure as any of this stuff. So uh, those of you who have been ITIL persuasion may know these as configuration items. So anything that you can interact with on a day-to-day -day basis as a systems administrator so uh, networking baselines, uh, package installations, uh, the contents of configuration files, uh, directories, symlinks, these sorts of things. Um, these are what we call resources, and these are what are under management and configuration management systems. And what you do is you configure these all in a highly, highly, highly specific way so that they act in concert. And can be on a single node, across many nodes, but they're all configured just so, and they provide that service, right? And that is your application. And the thing about infrastructure, though, is that it evolves. And you need a tool that's flexible enough to let you actually deal with this evolution of an application. So, drink lots of coffee here. Um, most applications start their life out looking like this, okay? So it's a single node, and it could have any, any number of uh, resources on it that make up an application. So most things start their lives out on a developer's laptop, right? And if you're lucky, he's developing it in a VM that at bare minimum is running the same operating system that you plan on eventually running in production, right? But it's all contained on a single node. So they'll choose their software, they'll go on the internet, they'll read a tutorial, they'll download some stuff, right? They'll install some packages, they'll probably install a database, configure some tables, um, install a bunch of libraries and these sorts of things. But they'll get it configured and it'll all be running on one node. And then you have your prototype and we play with it, this is good, let's start moving it through QA, we're gonna eventually move it into production. And the first thing that happens to an application is this, right? So I've now taken the infrastructure that my application is composed of and moved it onto multiple nodes. So let's separate the database tier out from the rest of the application in an effort to isolate disk subsystems or whatever. And typically the next thing that happens is this, right? Well, we're gonna make that database highly available or at least fault tolerant. Um, so you've just added even more infrastructure, more things to manage, more things to maintain, more configuration to actually uh, deal with, more things to document poorly on your wiki. <laughs> I'm 
marrying us for fun. Uh, but you know, the the important thing is that it has a topology, right? So this topology itself is another thing that you have to manage in the infrastructure. It's it's part of it, you know. So yeah. So unlike an individual node within an infrastructure, the infrastructure itself actually is a snowflake. Okay. Because the application and the infrastructure that it runs on are symbiotic. The needs of one will affect the shape of the other. Right? So if you're running a high I.O. application, the infrastructure that it's going to be running on is going to look a lot different than if you're just you know, cracking passwords on EC2 or something like that. Right? Um, so there you go. And unfortunately, complexity only tends to increase instead of decrease. Um, in your adventures, I highly recommend trying to decrease it, but unfortunately, that rarely happens. And then that happens, and you know, now all of a sudden your wiki's a mess, and you are up at three o'clock in the morning debugging weird things because the system that you brought in last week has no idea what's going on. And there we go. So. In order to actually deal with this complexity and deal with like this exploding amount of like detail that you need uh, to manage inside of an infrastructure in an application, you need a configuration management strategy. And these have had a long Shell scripting, so shell scripting uh, with actual rules instead of uh, you know just a mess of like bash, and then it evolved even further, and then you get uh, declarative syntax languages like CF Engine, Puppet, and Mapshed. So what you should not do, however, is use this as your configuration management strategy. Golden images, golden images of the devil. Um, do not use them, uh, they will make your life a living hell. And here's why. Um, here's a typical boring infrastructure. I have no idea what this does, I just made it up. Okay. Uh, but it has various components and various tiers. So we look at this one, and you know, we've got a database tier, a caching tier, an application server tier, and then metrics and monitoring. Okay. So if you're using uh, golden images as your primary configuration management strategy, this is what your life looks like. So we have a new compliance mandate, right? Let's say your security guys have been noticing, uh, you know, you're getting a bunch of botnets on the internet, like scanning port 22, and trying a bunch of different logins on your, on your machine, right? So we're going to stop that, so we're going to move SSH on to a different port, right? So your goal here is to change four bytes on every single last one of these machines. You're changing four bytes. So what do you do when you're using uh, golden images as your configuration management strategy? You do this. You go around to every single last one of these things. So you got six golden images that you're updating four bytes on, right? And then you're shoving, I don't know, four gigabytes of data down a pipe to, re to redo the VM. Like, what? why would you do that? That's insane. Um, and then you do this, you go around to every tier in the infrastructure very, very carefully, uh, deleting them and like bringing up new ones. Uh, you ever hear Mark, Mark Bridges talk? He ever says how many sysadmins does it take to change a light bulb? This is what he's talking about, <laughs> is doing this. Um, so stop doing that. And you know, this is very brittle. You have to do this in, in maintenance windows, you better be careful. And you know, if you're not using the right uh, you know, hosting technology, uh, you better be careful that you don't break your configs. Because if you delete an EC2 machine and bring up a new one, guess what? It's going to have a different IP. You've just invalidated all the configs in your infrastructure. You broke the topology. Now you have two problems. You've updated your SSH config, but now you've got to go around to all the machines and like updating their configs to wire everything back together. So that's why golden images are the devil. Don't do that. So instead of what we have is this state of desperation, right? So we have exploding complexity and like no way to manage it. 
Um, so what we end up doing is using the, one of these new green configuration related tools. I like Chef, you might have guessed. But Chef lets you solve this problem by allowing you to do this. Write programs, okay? So I know this is a room full of systems administrators and the favorite whiny thing you like to say is, I'm not a programmer. Fuck you, you are. <laughs> you are a programmer. <laughs> <laughs> Deal with it. Deal with it. Um, you might, you're not a software developer, right? You're not, you know, like solving Project Euler problems in your spare time for fun, you know? But you're a program. Like, own up to it. Just deal with it, right? Um, so, what you're doing with these programs is you're generating configuration, and you're generating the configuration directly on the nodes that need them, right? So, that's how you're managing your topology. So, instead of trying to version control uh, configuration files, um, don't do that. Just version control the programs that generate the configuration files instead. So, here we go. But these programs, these programs are special. These aren't normal programs. These are programs that give you declarative interface to the resources under management. And that's actually really important because declarative interface, this has the side effect, and it's a remark <coughs> remarkably handy side effect of being item potent. What that means is that it's safe to actually uh, run over and over and over and over again. So unlike traditional scripting, um, which is actually unsafe to, to run on a machine, so let's say, let's say you write a bash script, regular machine, the machine's functioning, you run that script on it again, you've just broken your machine. Because um, if you're doing things like you know, echoing lines into the ends of files and doing that sort of thing on multiple runs, you're going to end up with a machine that's not in the state that you intended it to be. And beyond added potency, uh, under the hood, there's actually uh, convergence happening. So convergence is when uh, one of these control loops, so uh, convergent operators as they're called, uh, is managing a thing. It basically checks to see if it needs to do something or not before taking action. And if it does, it moves it to its correct state. And if it doesn't, it just skips on to the next state. Are you suggesting that declarative-based configuration management is 100% item potent? Or are you allowing for... Am I doing what? 100% item potent. Or are you allowing for cases where that might actually bite you? I'm sorry. Could you... Are you suggesting that declarative base configuration management is 100 is by definition 100% item potent. I'm saying a property of a declarative interface right. is item potency. Right. Right. So imagine multiplying a number times one. Doesn't matter how many times you do that. Right. So 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 the question simply is that does that apply to all declarative base configuration management, or are there cases where you're going to have declarative base configuration management a configuration mm -hmm. that that's going to fail? Um. It depends on how it's implemented. So the special case declarative uh, resource would be the execute resource. Um, so in that case, it's actually up to you to define your convergence checks. So anything else, well, let's look at these. Um, I'm just going to skip this slide. So infrastructure is code. You're encoding everything into files, saving and get great, cool. So let's look at these. So a package provider, a template provider, and a service provider. So each one of these things is actually going to do the work of checking to see whether or not it needs to take action. So that's the convergence check. Right? So no matter how many times I run this, I could put this on a while loop and run it. And it'd be fine. So yes. So declarative interfaces, two things, are always at the point. If they're implemented properly. Excellent. So, here is a brief um, chef recipe. Right? This one manages NTP. Right? It has three stanzas. Right? This is a very common design pattern for uh, anything that you can install from the Linux operating system's native package manager. So, we're going to install the NTP package. We're going to write a configuration file and start the service. Sounds very familiar, right? Um, under the hood, though, there's a provider that actually figures out what it needs to do. So if you're running this on a Debian-based system, it's going to be like, oh, look at me, I'm a Debian. It's going to use apt-get to like install NTP. Right? If you're 
you're on Red Hat, it's going to be like, oh, look at this, my Red Hat. And it's going to use Yum to install NTP. Uh, FreeBSD, uh, Open Solaris, it's going to go use BlastWave, it's going to use Portage on Jintu, it's going to figure out what it needs to do, and then it's going to do it. Right? So, uh, this particular example um, actually has two resources hooked together with uh, this notify thing here. So what I'm doing here is I'm writing my configuration file. I'm using this template that I've stored in my code for, and I'm passing this variable in to the templating engine. So this is standard Ruby ERB templating. Um, not very complicated. But what this notify statement is saying is like, if I have to fix this file, restart the NTBD service. So I can log into this box. Like, dd slash dev u random like into my NTP configuration file, run chef client, and it's going to write the correct file and then restart the NTP service so that it actually picks up the configuration. Okay. And this is a very common design pattern, so we'll look to uh, SNMP, exactly like the NTP one. Right. The only thing I'm changing is the you know, the variable I'm passing into the templating engine. Now, in real life, you wouldn't actually specify this right there in the recipe like that. So my not public community string, you pull it from some other resource. Right? So you pull it from either an attributes file in the cookbook or you can pass it in in some other way. But you know, like, this is actually poor design. But it's a good example. And every time Chef Client runs, it runs this thing called OHA. Who here uses Puppet? All right, it's exactly like Factor. Right? Only it spits stuff out in JSON format. So Ohio runs on the node, um, and then all this stuff. So it's a fact when you try to start Postgre, it's going to say, no, you can't start Postgre. You have to adjust your kernel. And you go, oh, OK. And then you look up on the internet, like, so what do I do? Right? And it turns out that you have to take your total amount of RAM, like divide it by some number, and then like, adjust like, you know, your page tables and kernel settings and this sort of thing. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually looking at um, Ohio output. So I'm taking the amount of memory that I have which is ex expressed in kilobytes. I'm doing a string split on it to isolate you know, the actual number. Convert by three. And then for the pages, I'm dividing by my, my page size. Right? And I'm actually using that as input to my template, which is awesome. Uh, not really entirely easy to do in uh, other config management. That's what I've heard. And this is what actually confuses people the most about Chef when they start using it. it is there's multi-phase execution. So when you're running a Chef recipe, it doesn't do everything just then. Right? It actually compiles a resource collection. So here's from my imaginary beer cookbook. Right? And I have an imaginary resource called a beer bottle. Right? And the Chef recipe during its first phase is actually going to compile a resource collection and then in its next phase it's going to execute the resource collection. So this one will end up with 99 uniquely named item potent convergent beer bottles with deferred execution on the back that will be ran when the time comes. And then on subsequent ones nothing will happen. So, so could you declare a dependency so that the bottles are taken down and passed around in order? In order? Well, um, there, you have to do 99 before you Right. Well, so since it's Ruby, it is an imperative language. Mm -hmm. So the order that they're put on this array in the back is the order that they will be executed. So if you wanted to do this in reverse, you'd actually reverse this loop. Right. So you would say, 
one of 299. Okay. Or you could randomize them or do whatever you wanted to. So, so it doesn't reorder? No. So it's, it's the, the Ruby program is evaluated imperatively. Anything that it stumbles upon that is a chef resource, it takes, evaluates, sticks on the back end for deferred execution, unless of course you tell it to do it right then. But it'll, yeah, yeah. So multi-phase execution uh, bites a lot of people if they don't know what's going on when they start trying to use chef. Actually bit me. Um, very happy when I learned about it. So here it is. And recipes and cookbooks. So cookbooks are the, the unit of currency that um, you're dealing with when you're doing chef. So like I can write my beer cookbook, right? The recipe uh, gets stuck in the cookbook, right? Uh, along with the actual recipes, there's other things. So, let's see here. So my snmp.conf erb template, that's stuck in the cookbook. So the recipes plus anything that the recipes actually need to make themselves work. So template inputs, files, uh, just random stuff that you can shove in there that the recipes might, might need to refer to. How do you handle template differences between the different OSs? Um, you can do that any number of ways. You could just name that, like, you know, SNP Red Hat, SNP Ubuntu. We have this thing called uh, file spe specificity never say that right the first time, um, where you can actually make different directories that'll say, you know, like Ubuntu, Red Hat, these sorts of things, stick the files in there. Uh, there's a default directory, which is where this would load. <coughs> yeah, there's a number of different ways to address that. So in this, in this, sorry, in this example of the community string, is this doing like kind of an octet edit on it, or is this just doing variable insertion? Variable insertion, okay. How stable are the APIs? For like, Shep. For Shep. So if I get a new version of Chef, will a keyboard change? Are, are there any guarantees to the stability of the API? Um, they're fairly stable. It moves really fast, though. Uh, on hosted and private Chef, they actually there's actual like um, API backwards compatibility code paths built in. If you're running open source Chef server, you have to upgrade uh, your clients and your servers and lock stuff. And how frequently do they does it change? It's slowing down, isn't it? Um, Ken Hate's been out for two weeks in the last release before that. Ken 6 was two days because there was a bug in the Right, but when Ken 4 came out. Yeah. Um, fairly often. It depends. So is it a problem to always you know, stay up to date with the, with the latest? No? Right. You just have to keep I up? Mean, it's the actual API itself is fairly stable, um, but if you're, if you're consuming it with hosted or private, uh, it just doesn't matter. However, um, if you are using open source, it is an issue. So, that's not the hard to upgrade, right? You just use Chef to upgrade Chef. Not, right? So, there's that. So, let's see here, recipes and cookbooks. All right, so this is what using it actually looks like, right? So, you write your recipes, you write your cookbooks, you do all this stuff. You do this on your chef workstation, typically your laptop, um, check your Git, great. You upload it to chef server. You never actually log in to chef server, but use the APIs to upload to chef server. Then you provision a node that you intend to manage. So this is my node. I've just made an API call to, I don't know, Voxel. And now I have a node on the network with an operating system configured so that I can log into it. So knife bootstrap, or knife voxel server create, would say, okay, cool, makes the API call, uh, gets back data from the API call, so it's gonna have an IP or a host name, right? And then it's gonna wait for SSH to become active, and it's gonna log into it, and it's gonna install Chef. It's gonna install Chef, it's gonna write a configuration file, and an encryption key, and then the run list that you're specifying. And it's gonna hit and go. Then it's going to, based on the configuration you drop off, talk to the chef server and download the recipe that you want and the cookbook that it's in. So I'm saying configure this as an NTP client. So it says, cool. So it asks chef server API for the NTP cookbook and it executes the NTP <coughs> recipe out of the cookbook. 
and you just keep going like that. So I'm going to layer it up. So I'm going to do an SSH server, right? Same thing. You include an SSH server in the run list. It makes an API call to Chef server, downloads the open SSH cookbook, executes the server recipe. In. I thought you said the SSH, when you wait for SSH to respond. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that's so. In okay, from the view of the infrastructure as a service API, like you, you're going to need to wait for the machine to come up. And typically, the, the default configurations will let you log into them with SSH. Right? And this particular recipe would potentially, you know, tweak that configuration. Right? So if I wanted to only enable SSH version two, disable SSH version one, uh, you know, enable curl rows, log and do whatever I'm trying to do to it, I would tweak the configuration with this recipe. If I didn't, it would just be the default one that the machine came in. Okay? And you just keep going like this. You layer them. So I'm saying, all right, I'm gonna do my Apache recipe. Sweet, now you have Apache. Your PHP recipe. Okay, cool. So it's PHP, maybe fix the files. Who knows? It's your recipe. And these things can get kind of long. So we have these things called roles, which are basically containers for recipes. So I can stick it in a base role where I can say, all right, we're going to turn off SLX because it's a pain in the butt. We're going to configure our Etsy hosts. Um, we're going to install some package repositories. And we're going to install like, you know, man pages and you know, like LSOF and, and MAP and all this other stuff in my base debug tools uh, recipe. Okay. And then you can actually take that role and embed it in another role. So you have a web server role that includes the base role plus some web server stuff. Okay. It can look like this. So again, you edit them on your workstation or whatever. You use Knife. So Knife is actually a API, a command line API tool to interact with the API of Chef Server. So it would take this code that lives on your laptop and upload it to uh, Chef Server. It would be this tool Knife through the API. And you can nest roles, which is awesome. So you end up with this growing run list. You can actually turn it into that. So you're not manually, you know, managing like six thousand things in a machine's run list. And then this happens, right? So you would, you know, mess them down even further so that you have one top-level run list for every class of node that you're main, that you're configuring. So you have a web server role and you have a database role. So I need to automate um, the topology of this thing, though, right? So I have a web server. I need to actually point it at the database to so get its data, right? So traditionally, you have been able to do IP planning, right? You can sit down and say, I have a subnet. It's an RFC 18 subnet, and it begins with a 10, right? And it has a slash 24. I, and I'm going to give you know the first IP five IPs and networking equipment, and then I'm going to stick this stuff over here in this rain. Powered by DHCP pools, right? So I'm just going to get some random IP. So the config file that points the web server to the, data to the database actually needs to get that information from somewhere. And this is where the sauce is in Chef. So we have this thing called search. So Chef client runs all high on the node, generates that big JSON blob, and then along with the run list that you gave it, actually saves this thing as a node object back to Chef server, which you can then search. So on my web server, I can actually search Chef server for a database server, take that node object, dig out the IP information, insert it into a template, remove the template, and start the service. So here's an example for HA proxy. This is straight out of the HA proxy cookbook. So <laughs> two lines in a larger recipe. So the first one is saying, all right, pool members of declaring a variable. I'm saying search my nodes for the ones that have the role web server. So what, what you end up with is an array full of these node objects called pool members. 
which you then pass to the templating engine as a variable. And then the templating engine actually will iterate over each one of the members of this array. So pull members at each, and do, and then actually pull information out of the node object over into the template. So that's awesome. Can you search for multiple conditions? Yep. In it's a uh, it's solar. So everything's indexed by solar. So any solar search syntax you can come up with. So you can do like boolean ands and ors and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So you can search for all my web servers with under four gigs of RAM, or search for all my database servers whose host name begins with the Q. If you, want. you can make it up, but you can, the whole thing's indexed by solar, and you can search against it. Can you use uh, uh, threads to parallelize some of the stuff that you check? Excuse me? Can you use Ruby threads to parallelize stuff? Can you use Ruby threads to parallelize some of the stuff that you check? Um, so why not? I mean, it's just Ruby. Right? So if you wanted to you know, do multiple searches, I guess, or it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, but you could, yeah. Not, not for searches, but more for uh, more for uh, oh, enforcing for, some of the... Yeah. Um, we don't. Just because, you know, like if, if we were to take like multiple um, units of intent, so multiple recipes, and say, all right, I'm going to have my SSH thing recipe like over here executing in this thread, and I'm going to have my Apache recipe executing over in this thread. Right? You're going to end up with like weird locking issues where you've got like two things both trying to access the package manager at the same time and that sort of thing. So you just kind of do it all in one big monolithic like, sweep. So. There's that. Who, who here uses Munin for anything? Who has used Munin ever? Yeah? Awesome. So here's the thing about Munin. Uh, Munin, on the server side, you have to configure it. You need to populate its configuration file with a list of all the stuff you want to monitor. Right? So there you go. So Munin server actually gets to search the nodes in your chef infrastructure for things that have the attribute Munin client set to true. You can then take this and populate its configuration file. The meaning client, you have to actually configure to be able to accept polls from the server. Right? So it's one of my favorite examples because it's a nice two-way searchy configuration awesomeness thing. And it makes a really good example. So there's Munin. And what this lets you do though is when you actually add a, a node to an infrastructure, it's never that easy, right? Never, ever, ever is it that easy. So what you actually have to do after you do that is this, right? So now I need to like log into my metrics monitoring system. I need to configure my monitoring system to actually monitor this thing. I need to configure my metrics. Uh, you know, I need to configure Graphite to be able to accept connections from this thing. I need to configure my memcache firewall rules to be able to accept packets from it. I need to log into my Postgres server at the pghba.conf in order to actually accept connections from this thing. So it's never as easy as just adding a node to connect. You always have to go around and edit um, different pieces of the infrastructure running in the larger role. And I just can just off the top of my head think of like this many different little things I might need to tweak in order to make that uh, red dot actually functional within the larger infrastructure. So that's that. Um, golden image cloning cannot, cannot cope with this. Chef can. So, there you go. Uh, so you can build anything with these things. So since we're operating at such an atomic level here, we're manipulating files and directories and running processes and package installations and network card settings and these sorts of things, you can actually build them up higher and higher into larger constructs and build anything you can think of, right? So build yourself an infrastructure as a service uh, thing with, you know, Chef. Install OpenStack with it. That's actually one of the preferred ways to install OpenStack is using your Chef cookbooks to make you an IIS system, which you can then provision with Chef again and build more stuff on top of that. Right? Um, you can, yeah, run anything on it. So, and then you're automating the management of it. 
uh, through these convergence loops. And that makes your life easier. And that's awesome. What happens if shift shorter down? Then you cease to make changes. For questions, it would be good to have the microphone so that the video can capture it and everyone can hear it too. Okay. Or you could just repeat the question. You could repeat the question. Repeating the question more simply. Okay. So he asked me what happens if chef server goes down. Um, chef server goes down, you just can't make the changes. Right. Okay. So everything's a pull based methodology. So that helps in a lot of different ways. So the first one is, you know, if a machine's down for maintenance or simply doesn't exist yet, you can turn it on and it'll pull down its policy and execute it. So that way, so instead of like, we're gonna push out all the security updates, right, and five of your 600 machines are off, then those five machines are gonna miss the security update versus the pull-based methodology, you're gonna get it. What's up? Two questions. Okay. I'm just gonna give them practice of repeating the question. Oh, next. <laughs> uh, first question is, if the chef server is down, can clients just run off the cache files that they downloaded recently? Um, no, the chef kind of failed. So okay. chef uh, fails fast. If it encounters an error, it just stops. Okay. Versus maybe doing this and not doing that. And everything. Okay. Um, and the second question is, what about dependencies that can take a long time? So for example, uh, the example that you just gave with um, you needing to do a firewall update and stuff, mm -hmm. I found that often you don't want to actually add something to the load balancer until you know, 30 seconds after the server is running or the service is running because it needs right. a while to really get up to speed. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So that's called the convergence orchestration problem. Yeah. And it's your, snow, it's your snowflake, so you need to solve that however you need to, right? So, um, by default, Chef does not run on the loop. So you can actually configure it with the Chef Client Cookbook. Uh, if, if you use that, the default convergence loop is 15 minutes. But you can tweak that down to never all the way up to like constant convergence. So if you've got like, you know, a big hairy mess of like Java code that's running in web sphere, it takes a half an hour to start, you know, probably don't want to run that loop on a 15 minute loop. Right? So there's that. It's it's up to you really. So like you can do it various different ways. So knife SSH is one way. So you can do knife SSH roll web server group A chef client and that'll kick off the run. So if if you do have the kind of infrastructure that you do need to uh, introduce um, special timing into the convergence loop, you gotta figure out how to solve it. Hi. Uh, is there any sort of self-discovery mechanism for clients to find the chef server? Because I imagine that like re-imaging or updating mm -hmm. the chef server could have the same kind of issues in terms of IP and hostname changes um, right. that the other things would have. And if not, how do you deal with that? Like, what would you do if you got a new chef server? So you're talking about some sort of like MDNS sort of thing? Or like, yeah, maybe yeah. Um, yeah, some sort of broadcast-based system or using a or yeah. something. Nope, it's just uh, it's in a configuration file that you bootstrap the node with. And if your chef server changes IPs, well, First of all, I should be referring to it as a DNS name, but um, yeah, if you need to change the chef server that your client's reporting to for some reason, that's that's going to be an operation that you're going to need to figure out how to solve. Like, it's not going to automatically find it. I mean, you need to update the clients. Um, is there a way to put the chef server into read-only mode? Say something happened at a bad network event, and I just want to know what's changed. I don't want you to actually fix anything. Just so I could get a report and then do an assessment and see what I want to do going forward. Okay. Um, not right now. It's uh, chef ticket number 13 is no op mode. We do not have that yet. And it's coming. It's coming soon. But as of right now, it will fix everything. It won't not take action. Um, well, then a follow on question. Is there a way to. to Query the information base without bringing the server up so I could have some idea. Six say again? Is there a way to say query the existing information base without it actually being turned on? Let's take a 14. 
Is there a way to create oh. a chef server without chef server being? Well, no. Having have, say I've got a chef server. I had something bad happen. Okay. Misconfiguration, whatever. I want to find out what's there. This mm -hmm. has my pool of all my good information in it. Yeah. But I don't want to turn it up because it's going to do bad things. I think. But I still want to find out what's in it. Is there like some sort of API or anything? Mm -hmm. So you're talking reporting. about freezing the state of chef server? Well, just turn it off and do reporting on the data. You know, kind of. A, Mentally, you know, it's like you're not, chef's not up, but mm. I need to know what it thinks is there, and you know. Couldn't you just send queries to the database? Yeah, you just query the, the backend database. So if, okay. you're running, if you're running open source chef server, <laughs> yeah. you can actually probably go in couch. Everything's backed by couch. All right, um, that's fair. Uh, information. Um, um, yeah. Uh, is there any? I wasn't clear from your discussion of run lists and recipes if there's any concept of staging in place yet with Chef. So, for instance, I have uh, I have these servers at each of our branch offices uh, that are also acting as VPN gateways, and they're 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 mirrors of our internal DNS. Uh, they're passing out TFTP, DHCP stuff, etc. But before I can bring a lot of things up, I have to do other things first. And then I might be, after I've done those things, I might change them. So like take uh, ResolveConf, for instance. Mm. Um, initially, <clears throat> when I'm bootstrapping this, I want to make contact with the external side of our VPN. Okay. Um, but once it's up, I want to be doing resolution internally. I see. Um, kind of. So everything's imperatively ordered, right? So you can actually, um, there's actually no end to the number of like little tricks that you can do. Like you can hack around and do things. Like you can ignore failures. You can uh, actually code in like weird like timing blocks and stuff. You can say like if it's not between these hours, do this. You can set uh, like a semaphore. You can, like write stuff to Chef Chef server, and then wait for it to change, have something else change it, and then take action on it. I have, a, I have an example cookbook, uh, it's a PKI cookbook, that um, uses nothing but convergence to actually drop SSL certs off within an infrastructure. And it uses some of these tricks where like, I'll just write like weird like little basically flags to chef server, and like once they're released, go ahead and take this action. So you can code anything in, you can say search chef server for the stuff, or maybe even use data bags is something I didn't talk about um, to just like stash information and then take action based upon state. So you can create, store, track state in the chef server via data bags or manipulation of the node objects themselves. Does that help? Uh, yeah, I think so. It, it basically you can you can declare configuration uh, configuration changes um, that without having them sort of like step on each other essentially. Right. Yeah. Over here. Okay. Actually, I think my question was kind of similar to what he was just asking. With uh, Chef Serve, can I just put custom keys and values in there? Oh yeah. Anything you want. From from the client or from the server from anywhere? It would be you want to do it from the client. So wait, Chef Server is as stupid as possible. It doesn't do anything but like serve your data through APIs. It doesn't ever try to like go out and do anything anywhere. It just sits there answering data right? and indexing it and making it available. So you do it from recipes. You first and then you. Right? So, um, so oh, you or me or him? Oh, uh, uh, he can go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How do you feel about testing uh, changes to your chef configurations? Like, is there any way of doing like a, a partial rollout to see if things work? Like, mm -hmm. your experience problems with the rollback, if it's not. Uh, right. How, how do people usually uh, deal with that? So we have the concept of environments as a first class thing, starting in the chef tin. So it's basically a field in the node object that you just tag it with a string that says development, staging, and production. Right. So you can do that. Right? So you'd have your standard multi-tiered like, you know, environment where you say, okay, let's test these cookbooks over here and you know, see if they work and everything. That's good for functional testing, but as I'm sure you're aware, like, there's no testing like testing in production. Right? So once things hit production and they get real traffic and stuff on them, then you, know, like, you can't really simulate that. So 
if you wanted to say do like a one percent test or something like that, you could designate like a guinea pig group or something. You can tag nodes. Um, you have a role that says like guinea group <coughs> and apply it to those two or yeah, any basically any way you can think of that would be appropriate for you. So like have a more specific kind of problem, I would come up with no, I'm just curious to yeah, see. So if you, you can tag nodes and basically make guinea pigs out if you want to do that. So related to the guinea, I mean it's followed to that question, you know, it's okay. the same question, but the guinea pig problem. So if you really wanted to go like I want to test this new change to five percent of my environment, mm -hmm. the best, easiest, there's no clear, easy way to do it in GP you have to code something to say pick five percent of my boxes at random, right. make a dynamic guinea pig group. Deployed on these big group, mm -hmm. and check back with the player and make sure no one kills you. Yeah, that's that's how you do it. Um, so you, you're talking about nodes and roles. Uh -huh. Where does that information come from? Uh, like Puppet, you can either like define it in manifest or have that data come from LDAP or like. Mm -hmm. Server X is a web server, and server Y is a metal server. Right. So the the roles are actually entities in the run list. So you bootstrap it down. You're part of the bootstrap script is actually writing uh, slash Etsy chef for boot.json, and then it calls chef client dash j, and then that file. So you end up with this run list in the node object. So you have a high output, you have the run list, and then any other attributes that might be present in the code books, all assembled as part of this node object and saved to the server. So that's what you're actually searching against is the run list. So you define that on each node? Yeah, as you bootstrap it. Yes? So the sysadmin has to be very familiar with uh, all of the configuration you need to configure. Mm -hmm. So do you think is, is it possible or is there any huge advantage to make the, for example, the Linux distribution, uh, the difference in those distributions transparent to the users? So, yeah, in, in the, the code books, the question was, um, systems have to know their systems that they're many, right? There's no way around it. So is, do we try to, abstract the differences as much as as much as possible inside the code books. So yes. So you can write um, multi-platform cookbook. So Apache 2 is like our workhorse cookbook that we include in lots of other recipes. So anything you can think of that needs like you know, like a web front end, so like you're not geo server, you need a server and this sort of thing. Um, it includes the Apache 2 recipe. And inside the recipe you'll you'll actually see it making uh, case statements about, um, I'm on this platform, so I'm going to do this. I'm on that platform, so I'm going to do that. Because the, the resource abstraction, so like package, you know, versus, uh, it's going to use yum versus apt. Um, that's possible to abstract to providers, but the actual name of the package that you need to install is not. Right? So you would need to make a case statement between it. But, but will the sysadmin write those case, uh, case in, in, in this recipe or the, 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 the server can't program, so file will, will take care of this. Yeah, the, the system can drive the system. Oh. So there's no magical pixie dust here, right? Like, you still have to do systems administration, right? Like, you're just automating away the most mundane bits, right? Still have to know what you're doing, so. Can it make it easy to say, well, with Red Hat, the package you, you would need to encode that knowledge into the recipes yourself as a systems administrator programmer that's automating your infrastructure. So. Anyone else? Hey. Two questions. Two questions. Um, first, can you talk about common patterns that are used, like a chef serverless infrastructure? Is that possible? Is that just insane? Yeah, no, that's fine. We have this thing called uh, Chef Solo which uh, is very popular. The joint guys use it a lot. And basically what you can do is you can 
figure out a mechanism to get your cookbooks onto your server. So very popular is just check them out again, right? Get clone this, this repo. And so now you have the cookbooks on your Chef server, and you install Chef, and you install um, config that points it to wherever you check the cookbooks out to, and then you can run it in solo mode. Uh, the problem with that, though, is that you're losing all the fun topology management stuff of, ser of server. So you're, it's still up to you to manually manage the topology of your infrastructure and distribute those config files that stitch everything together. Okay. Is, is it possible to like query the chef server for the, the catalog? That's what it's called in Puppet. And get a copy of that catalog as like a YAML file and apply that later to multiple machines? No. Okay. So, um, question two, you mentioned something about data bags. Okay. Is that too deep to go into? No, it's fine. So, data bags are basically just arbitrary JSON, JSON structures that you can create and store in Chef Server. Um, very much like like people use Redis as like just like an arbitrary, like, you know, kind of like data structure server. Like, it's kind of the same thing. So, I can just like, I can literally make a JSON structure like six levels deep that contains nothing of importance and save it to Chef Server and access it later. And that's all it really is. That's all a data bank is. It's just some place to stash uh, information that needs to be global to the infrastructure. But, like passwords. Like passwords. How does that work with encryption? How does that work with encryption? So uh, you can use this thing called encryption or encrypted data bags um, that will actually, so you supply a key to it as an argument, but now you have another problem where you have to take care of distributing the secret key to all the nodes that you have under management. So if you're, if you're using Post and Chef, and you're storing passwords and data bags and things, you can actually encrypt them, but it's up to you to actually uh, manage the keys on, on the nodes themselves. So you would do that with custom, custom bootstraps, that sort of thing. Um, when you're bootstrapping a node, um, you're actually executing, you're rendering a script and shoving it down as a safe pipe, and it's like executing on the other end. So you have to make a custom one that says, you know, stick this blob of data in this file over here that I will then later use to decrypt things. Right. So, ooh, five hands up at the same time. I'll let you guys microphone take for me. Uh, you mentioned hosted, private, and open source. Can you explain the difference? Uh huh. Yep. So that's three ways to consume Chef. So we have open source Chef. Uh, Opscode X as the community stewards to that project. We have a very active IRC channel on Freenode, and it's awesome. You can go in there and ask questions, and people will answer them immediately, pretty much 24-7. Um, you can download it uh, from you know, Opscode, you've got a page and everything. Um, that's up to you to manage, though. Yeah. Uh, you can't buy support for that. You can't do anything. Um, Host and Chef is our SaaS model service, so um, it's actually where new features and changes to Chef Server appear first. So right now the architecture for Host and Chef looks like, okay, we have CouchDB in the back end, and then we're going to have um, these API endpoints, then we're going to have the Solar Indexer, and RabbitMQ, and all this stuff in here doing the things. Well, we're rewriting all that in Erlang in Host and Chef. That uh, will eventually trickle out into uh, open source chef server, but um, you're going to get lots of speed improvements and that sort of thing hosted. And then private chef is actually the, the hosted code base that you run yourself behind your firewall. And that's all that is. And standard enterprise software licensing schemes. And that's where it gets so. uh, Any particular rationale behind the selection of Ruby? for the nope. implementation of this project. Okay. <laughs> You'd have to ask Adam about that one. Um, so yeah, it's written in Ruby. Um, sorry, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be all the rage these days. Yeah. Um, well, the, the idea was that you have, it's a third generation programming language, right? So what that gives you is access to libraries, right? So the idea is like, you know, if, let's, let's pretend it was written in Python instead of Ruby, right? That means I can go use like the, the Python MySQL library to dig information out of like MySQL server, take this information and then shove it in the resources that I'm going to use later. 
right? So anything you can find a library for in Ruby, you can actually leverage in Chef. So if you wanted to like use like Facebook's API and you wanted to name your servers after your Facebook friends, go for it, right? Because you can just like write a recipe that imports, you know, live Facebook or whatever it's called, and you can go out and make API calls, get data, feed them into templates, and that, that's the rationale. Right? Mm -hmm. Versus if we did that, you know, we wrote this in Haskell, you know, like you're not going to have a very rich you know, library set to, to choose from. No, it's just as a Python guy, I'm kind of holding out for someone to come out with yeah. a configuration. So, so there's a new one. I'll send you a link. There was something that came out for Python in Switzerland. That's pull based as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm, oh, no, it's push based. Okay. Um, there's a Pi Chef. Pi Chef. Oh, yeah, what? there's a Pi Chef for interacting with, uh, it, with the API. So if you'd like to re implement Chef in Python, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm that ambitious, but I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I've contemplated that from time yeah. to time. Actually, the question two parts. One is, does the chef server pass down the templates, or does it pass down finished products to the to the clients? Passes down the raw code. So, no code is ever actually executed on chef server. Okay. Right. So it's it's always you get the run list, you pull down the entire cookbook, including the recipes you don't have you have no intention of actually executing. Right. So the NTP cookbook might have like 50 recipes in it, you only want to use one of them, I think it's going to pull down the whole thing. Could be wrong about that. That's the, that's the kind of thing they like to change between like version and yeah. so, that, you know. so, yeah, but everything's evaluated on the client side, nothing's ever evaluated on the server side. Um, the other half of that is, exactly how much Ruby do I need to install to get this running? Yeah. Good question. So. One of the big, uh, you know, I guess peeves that people have with Ruby is um, the the community in general kind of moves at like an, an ooh shiny pace, you know. So that's kind of a pain. So like if you're going to use, uh, let's say Red Hat Five, right? Red Hat Five ships with what Ruby one eight five or something retarded like that, you know. Like so you can't actually use like your system Ruby, right? So now you're in the pro now you get the problem of like, okay, well I need to rip out the, the Ruby on my system, but do I really want to do that? Because I don't know if anything else has no. a dependency on that. You know, like you care no. about Python, right? Exactly. So do you install it in parallel? How do you do that? Right? So now you have like this big problem of just getting Chef to run at all. Right? And uh, we're fixing it. S3.amazon.aws.com slash opcode full stack is where we're spitting these puppies out. So these are full stack installers. Nice. Um, you install this on a machine? Here, let's do this. Now, does that put the, the Ruby dependencies in their own sort of little virtual environment? Or yep. <clears throat> so everything above libc is contained in slash op slash ops code slash embedded it. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, remember how people used to, I guess they still do, I guess, uh, ship around their own JVMs with their Java software? Same thing. Mm -hmm. So like we're shipping around our own Ruby 192 and every single thing you could possibly need to make Chef go, it's coming as one single RPM cool. that package. Where's my other? And that's, uh, and that's uh, just to be clear, is that with the open source project or is that just with? The it's open source, source. Okay. yep. So currently, if you wanted to, it's still in beta. Um, its code name is Omnibus. Um, it has some Omnibugs in it that we're still trying to check out before <laughs> unleashing it to the next But, uh, so let's bootstrap. Oh, yeah. Alright, so when this comes up, I'll, I'll show you on the bus, but okay. yeah, it's just everything pre canned right. and slash pop ops code embedded. So you no longer have this nightmare of like 16 different, like, you know, Ruby versions across five different, you know, like operating systems and three different versions of them. So you have like this crazy, unwieldy matrix of stuff. Yeah, it was very frightening the first time I installed Puppet. Yeah. I was like, what is this doing to my computer? <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's the same thing. Just a follow-up question to him. So 
All right, a follow-up question to him. Um, what, do you have the ability to install gems from the Ops Code Ruby? Yeah, you could use them. You could use the, okay, so when this is done, um, I'll show you, I'll log in and show you around. But yeah, if, if you want to use a, a gem inside of a chef recipe, then you can use the gem packet resource to install that, and it would pull it into the op, ops code embedded world. And it would live there. Versus if you're using that to, let's say you're hosting a Rails app or something, then you install your actual Ruby that you're going to use for this thing over here. And use yeah, the local somewhere Ruby else. Yeah, so you would need to actually specify full paths. Okay, but follow on to that. How do you manage the gems that are outside of that lovely lump of code that now I've started layering stuff on top of consistently? Do I have a list? in my desk saying I have to add these things. Well, I've taken that, I've installed a few more gems on it on the client or the server. And For, is that managed just through Chef Recipes? Yeah. Okay. Chef Recipes. Yes. Um, if you hadn't guessed, I do a lot of things with Puppet right now and with other tools that break networking in the process of making configuration changes. Okay. Um, uh, it's, or, or run the risk of breaking networking if they're not done in the right order. Right. Um, is, I wasn't clear from some of the questions that were asked earlier or answered earlier, uh, whether or not it's possible to download all of my package dependencies and, and, and actually cache the, the result of what the, whatever the current you know, uh, chef state is. Mm -hmm. um, before actually <coughs> processing that that new version of my chef state on the on the node that's being managed. Well, it will download it all first and then process it. But if you want to pause halfway through the run. Well, I, I want to like let's say I, I'm doing a lot of things that involve downloading packages in order mm -hmm. to then get back to a state where I I'm actually able to talk to the internet again. Uh, okay. Is it possible to basically download all of my my packages ahead of time? And uh, I mean, essentially, can I get everything I need to get to the next level uh, before I actually start processing Good. the the setup of those packages? Yeah. So so instead of um, so to do that, you instead of using like the package uh, resource. And its default provider, which is to use the underlying uh, package manager, which right. is usually configured to go off to the internet and get stuck. Right. You could just, you know, say, all right, pull down these files, stash them in this directory. Okay, but there's no there's no built-in facility for no there's no built-in handling d d analyzing the dependency tree and just getting everything ahead of time and then going right. So yeah. when when you hit a package resource, it's going to be the same as typing apt-get install whatever. Right. So. Mm -hmm. If you need to do something fancier than that, it's up to you to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. What so. cool. else? Anyone? Oh, okay. What's up? Uh, not trying to start a release more, but the presentation was from the, the sort of perspective of not having a configuration management tool now. You right. have one now. <laughs> okay. Why, why Chef? All right. Um, which one do you use? Uh, CF Engine 2. CF Engine 2. Have you looked at 3 yet? Yes. Okay. So people <laughs> love to compare Chef and Puppet. Chef and Puppet, Chef and Puppet, Chef and Puppet. Um, Chef actually has a lot more in common with CF Engine 3 than Puppet. Uh, really the only difference, like the similarities between Chef and Puppet are that they're both written in Ruby. They both have external um, program that digs up information, so a high factor, and they're both configuration management tools. That's really it. Um, their actual usage patterns are completely different. Right? So in Puppet, you spend all day chasing down like require statements everywhere. Right? Um, I actually have, if you want to look at this, um, so I actually run the NYC DevOps meetup group, and soon I will have a a presentation that shows this off, but um, if you go here, I actually wrote an article that 
explains kind of like the convergent thing through the analogy of the pooping duck and, and <laughs> it's just down here. But you end up running a chef knife command that installs a CF engine server for you and drops off some CF engine policy that will set up the puppet server for you. <laughs> so here, here's, here's how to set up a puppet master in CF engine. And then you go down here and the next one, you hit it and it brings up another machine which actually bootstraps against CF Engine which sets up the chef server. Right? So we have code examples for all three here. So here's chef.pp. Right? So I have a puppet module for setting up chef server on my blog. Right? And if you actually like read through these things and crack them, you'll actually see that uh, chef has a lot more in common with CF Engine than it does with puppet besides the implementation language. So, and it's just, in my opinion, it's the easiest one of the three to use um, once you install it. So, uh, <laughs> 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 but there you go. So you that. When you say easy, what's the main challenge of CF Engine 3? Um, well, first of all, the, the language that it's written in is super, super, super dedicated to, to being, you know, CF Engine, right? So, I mean, it's super fast and super efficient because it's written by freaking theoretical physicists and crap sakes, but, you know, um, it's, it's definitely CF Engine only, right? So there's no way to actually plug other stuff into it and, like, go out and get information from outside resources. I can never import like a like an SQL like library into my recipes to help me dig information out of some database. Right? I'd have to encode variables into the actual configuration language. Right? Can you talk a little bit about the, the security of a, a large scale uh, cloud deployment and how you handle um, I guess I, I should give some more background. We use Chef right now, uh, where I work currently. I'm uh, sorry, Puppet. And one of the biggest problems that, that we've seen is that if we need to bring up, you know, 200 servers on EC2, that it's you know it's a pain in the ass. Right. Um, does Chef do anything to kind of make it a little bit easier? So security-wise, all right. So you have a magical key in Chef called the validation pen that has special superpowers of being able to create new nodes. That's all it can do. Um, so when you're bootstrapping a node, you, you write this special key to it, you bootstrap it, and you delete the key. And present, so knowledge of this secret grants you access to this infrastructure. Right? And that's a secret that can be revoked? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you just you, you d delete it off the thing. So part of the bootstrapping process, it actually generates a, a key specifically for that, that node. Right? Um, so that's that's how you get access to the Chef infrastructure, it's knowledge of this, this encryption secret. Where, as in CF Engine and Puppet Land, what you end up doing is semantic postname matching. So you can run Puppet in a mode where you would have a, a node and try to register itself to the Chef server, and then full stop. I have to go in, systems administrator, and approve this key. Right? In real, in real life, nobody does that. Everybody just turns on auto signing and then does a, a <coughs> sorry, an external node classifier based upon a regex in the CN of the certificate that's being presented, which is usually the host name. Right? So, so choose your button. Chef still uses X509 certificates, so once it is bootstrapped? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Oh. So if I was going to get started with Chef, um, oh, actually, I'd like this answer to be a, a, an item, not a list. Okay. okay. If I was going to get started with Chef, what's the one book or resource I should start with? Ah. <laughs> well, my good friend Stephen Nelson Smith wrote one. Um, try that. So. It's 8 o'clock, we need to be out of here by 8.30, so I'm going to be done. Um, Nylog, I believe you would like to give some things away. Thank you, Sean.
Lenny will uh, proceed with the uh, book raffle now. Oh. He's going to. Oh. All right. So the way this has actually traditionally been done is a speaker asks a variety of questions. It's kind of like trivia it's regarding Chef. I believe he has some questions for us. I can do that. And uh, so the book we're giving away is The Test Driven Infrastructure with Chef. And we're giving away three uh, vouchers for people who want. You can get a free book from O'Reilly online. And like I you get to choose your book too. When you fill out the form, you should put in my love in the form, and it'll all make sense. So take it away, sir. So yeah, so uh, we have three or four? Uh, we have four. three of these and a book. All right, so. Trivia. All right. So what year was Chef announced? What? What year was Chef announced? 2004. 2009? 2008. 2008. Late 2008. It was either November or December, but I remember it was 2008 because the elections were going on. So, uh, which one does he get? Which, which one does he want? I don't know. He's first. Would you like this book? Or would you like one of these? Yeah, I would like the book. You like the book? Alright. Thank you. Alright. So three more, three more. All right. What city is Opticode based in? Seattle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, two more. What is the current release number of Chef? What eight? Ten eight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So who gets the prize? <laughs> Okay, you have to ask Everybody's question. Question. You want to try different questions. First one to take out of my hand gets it. <laughs> Did you have to answer the question? What? Did you have to answer the question? And uh, let's see. What's the author's or the original author's name? Okay. Well you already got one. He did it too. Bye. Okay, Max, going back on it. I'll take it. Well, it's up here, everyone. What are you doing? Do you have any other questions? Guys, afterwards. Thanks, everyone. Okay, hold on. Just a second, everyone. Sunny and Aaron will be uh, leading the charge to take a little bar. Uh, we're going to a bar called The Tippler. It's at 425 West 15th Street, right around the corner, guys. It looks pretty nice. So, yeah, see you guys there. Cool. Thanks. Bye. All right.